Great, thank you. Good morning. Yes, my name is Trevor Blois, and I'm the disease diagnostician at 2020 Seed Labs. I'd like to start out by saying thank you to Farming Smarter for inviting me out here today. Um, hopefully you learn a thing or two. So mostly um, I'll, be, I'll be presenting statistics on uh, what we see at the lab as far as disease testing goes. Um, but I will be talking a little bit about this uh, new project that we're working on, um, which you know is alluded to by the title of the presentation, uh, Fetch a Fly and Find It. So I'll get started by talking a little bit about 2020 Seed Labs for those of you that don't know about us. Um, we were the first commercial seed testing lab in Canada, established in 1989, um, and we're still independently owned and operated. Uh, we provide services to farmers, seed growers, seed production, uh, crop protection companies, and even some non-agricultural industries. Uh, we have accreditation from the Canadian Food Inspection Agency for all crop kinds, and we are the only private international seed testing association accredited lab in Canada. Um, we have regular audits from the Canadian Seed Institute, um, and we have our QMS system, um, which is ISO 9001. <laughs> this is our uh, lab, our, our building up in NISCU. Um, perhaps some of you have come by for a visit for one of our open houses. Um, <clears throat> it's a relatively new building, uh, built just a couple years ago. So um, if, if you're ever up dropping off a sample, uh, just ask for a tour and we'll give you one. Uh, we offer services that include um, those seed quality um, testing services, germination, purity, vigor, of course. Um, seed health, which is what I do at the lab. And molecular analysis. So uh, plant pathogens, we can test for looking for their DNA. Um, varietal ID, um, and a growing um, part of our testing is uh, looking for uh, various GM events in, in, cer in certain crops. Um, and we also do research and training at the lab. Um, we regularly have uh, seed crater training up in the conference room. Um, and we also do uh, crop inspection. You can see there's a picture of me on the bottom there uh, doing a pea field where the heights of, height of the pea was about as high as my shoulders, so that was a real struggle to get through, but I survived. Um, into, the, uh, into the bulk of the presentation here, so I'll start out talking about the protocols that we uh, follow at the lab, how we, how we test for seedborne pathogens, and what kind of tests there are, and which tests should you request. Um, I'll get into statistics, what we've seen at the lab the past few years, and then I'll finish up by talking a little bit about the airborne spore testing. So at the lab, really, there's two uh, major methods for detecting seedborne pathogens, each with its own pros and cons. So the first one is molecular testing. So here we're looking for uh, DNA of the, of the pathogen, usually. Um, and you'll hear terms like conventional PCR, qPCR, ELISA, and DNA sequencing, but it's, it's all DNA testing. Um, the benefit is that it can be more sensitive. Um, you can test higher volumes of seed a lot easier um, following uh, molecular testing. Um, and it can be more specific, so we can look at you know, certain markers in the pathogen, uh, see which strain it is, for instance. Um, and the big benefit that you know, our, most of our clients see is just that quick turnaround for results. So normally it's 24 to 48 hours for, for a normal DNA test. Um, on the downside, you only get a plus or a positive or a negative result. Um, and you don't get a percent infected seed. And quite often, to make decisions on, the, on, the, on, on your farm, you need to know that um, percent infection so that um, you, know, you know how severe it is. Um, the traditional disease testing, which is what I do at the lab, is pretty simple. All you do is you uh, place sterilized plant tissue onto a growth medium. Um, so we take the seeds um, and we surface sterilize it in 2% bleach for five minutes. Um, we let that uh, dry in a flow hood. Then we, uh, then we just take spoons and we put it onto uh, petri dishes that have potato dextrose agar. And that's a broad spectrum growth medium. Um, so, you know, most fungi really like to grow well on it. Um, and then we just see what grows after seven days under room temperature, 22 degrees Celsius is what we grow it at. Um, and 75% white light, 25% UV light to help stimulate the, uh, the fungal colonies to produce spores. 
Um, and then I take a look at the plates. Um, you can see there's some images there of what the plates look like. Um, and I, I identify what those uh, fungal colonies are. One of the benefits is that you can test for a large number of fungi in a single test. So I can just take the seed, as long as I know that it grows under those conditions, then I know that it should, you know, it should show up on this test. We can manipulate those conditions if, if there's a certain pathogen that we know that we are looking for that, you know, doesn't grow well on PDA, say. Um, but, you know, you can, a single plate has, in, in our fungal screen, for instance, we look at 10 different path or 10 different fungi um, in cereals, and we can just say what that percent infected seed result is for each one of those. <laughs> on the downside, it does depend on the skill of the analyst. So I've been at the lab since uh, 2010, so I've been there for seven years now. Um, and, you know, I've seen all those weird things that you see, but, um, you know, somebody that's a little bit newer to, to the job, they, they might get tricked up on certain things. So um, it, it does depend on who's doing the analysis. Um, another thing is that contamination can be a problem. Um, so in the uh, right there, that, that photo is uh, rhizopus. Um, and that's a really common uh, fungus that's in the air all around us right now. Um, and it's, it's, you'll see it growing on your bread, uh, for instance. It's a bread mold. So um, it, it spreads through the air really easily. Um, and once it gets onto a plate, it takes over that plate in a matter of days and it will outcompete anything else on there. So, um, you know, s some labs can have problems with, with that spreading um, through all of their samples, but we keep it under control fairly well. Um, there is a longer wait for the results as well. We have to wait for those colonies to grow. So it's five to seven days, whereas with the molecular testing, you're looking at 24 to 48 hours. So with fusarium testing, the, the fusarium is the most common uh, test that we do at the lab, of course, fusarium, graminearum. Um, and there are the two options, DNA or plate. So which ones uh, should you use? Um, my recommendation is, you know, get both. Um, you get the advantages of both of those tests and you remove the disadvantages of each. Um, and we do have uh, le uh, packages at the lab that include these and, you know, it will test the largest volume of seed as well at the lowest price. So um, the, the DNA test is roughly twice the amount of seed as the plate test. Um, so a plate test is exactly 200 seeds. So, you know, for the whole thing, it, you'd be testing about 600 seeds. Or you can do one at a time. Most people do this, of course. Um, so if you believe the sample is going to be negative, you're in an area that you haven't seen much fusarium graminearum, we recommend the DNA test. Um, and if that does come back positive, then you need to know how severe that is. So you need to know a percent infection, which the plate test can tell you. Um, so we recommend following that up with the plate test. But if you think that the sample's going to be infected, down here in southern Alberta, um, you know, most, most likely it will be, uh, or it, it is a good chance in some areas at least, um, then, then just go straight to the plate. Um, but if it does come back 0%, why not follow it up with the DNA test so that you can make sure um, it's not one of these scenarios where you get a positive DNA test and a negative plate test, which can be um, a very low level of infection, so less than 0.5, which is as low as the plate can detect, um, or a late season surface infection. So um, we surface sterilize the seed, as I mentioned in the plate test, um, and that can remove anything that, um, you know, any source of inoculum that might have come into the field outside of that flowering period. Um, so you don't get that systemic internal infection, but you still have exposure to the Fusarium graminearum. And that will give you an early warning that Fusarium graminearum is starting to come into the area. Um, if, if you're not too sure, this is our recommendations um, based on what we've seen previously, and you'll see the statistics coming up. Um, so most of southern Alberta here, we do recommend going straight to the plate. Everything in red here is we recommend the plate method. The green ones, which is most of Alberta, but um, you know, not a lot of uh, um, crop growing areas, some, some up in the north, but um, it, it's the DNA test because they don't see Fusarium graminearum nearly as much. Other provinces, because it's so common in Manitoba and Saskatchewan, we do recommend the plate test. 
Um, so to get into the statistics, the actual you know, more interesting part of the presentation here, um, here's, here's the results from, from the lab since 2007. Um, this chart shows the percent of samples that are testing positive on the plate method, but it does include all of those negative DNA tests as well. I just you know, called them negative, of course. Um, so you can see back in 2007, it was quite low, and then we started to see a, you know, a slow increase up to 2010. It dropped it back down in 2011. Um, and then we see you know, quite a sharp increase. It continues at the same rate about um, since before 2011. Um, and then it kind of reaches a plateau around 2013 and 2014, and then drops back down 2015. 2016, again, we see a big rise. Um, and we reach our peak levels, which are you know just below 20% uh, seaborne infect or uh, samples that are testing positive in, in the province. So that's almost one in five, um, one in five samples in Alberta that are testing positive for fusarium graminearum on the plate. This year, because of the generally overall drier growing conditions, we're seeing you know much lower percent of samples that are testing positive, and we are seeing lower severity, so less uh, percent. Uh, infection on the average sample, which I'll show you in upcoming slides here. So um, we're down, um, you know, below levels even before 2015 um, and, you know, similar to 2010 right now. Um, if we split it up over the crop types, we see it uh, break down into the various susceptibilities. So we know Durham super susceptible to Fusarium graminearum, and you can see that in the green line here. Um, it is consistently, you know, coming back, coming back positive much more than the other crop types. Um, triticale, uh, we don't test a whole lot of triticale, so this is relatively low sample numbers, keep in mind. Um, but it is, you know, it, the, this does seem to show that it is more susceptible than, uh, say, wheat or barley. Um, which wheat is blue there, um, on a, a little bit lower down, and barley is the red. So barley is more uh, resistant to Fusarium graminearum than, than wheat. Um, interestingly, this year you can see um, in 2017 that both wheat and barley are coming in fairly similarly, uh, similar levels to each other, around 5% there, I believe it is. Um, and then uh, rye, we don't test a whole lot of rye. Again, that's low sample numbers, but we haven't seen any yet this year. Um, oat is very resistant, but last year we did see, um, you know, I think it worked out to about six samples that were positive. Maybe it was even more than that, actually. Um, but, you know, we, before that we saw a couple samples in 2014, but um, last year was a really bad year for Fusarium graminearum, so it is pretty concerning that we're even seeing it show up in oat samples. Um, this chart, um, you know, it looks at that average percent of infection. So um, to calculate the percent of infection, we look at how many seeds are infected out of 200, right? Um, and this takes all of the samples, including all those negative samples, um, and looks at, you know, what, what is the average percent in, in, in all of Alberta. And this year we're seeing way lower than we have in actually any other year. So, you know, we're, we're way, way down there. And this could change. It's still early in the testing season right now. Um, generally speaking, I'd say the testing season goes from, uh, from September until May of the following year. Um, but, uh, you know, the, 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 this will likely change. And sometimes it goes down, sometimes it goes up. It's tough to say, but, um, yeah, it, it is quite interesting that we're seeing such low levels. And, you know, this is, if we look at the actual positives and we look at that average percent infection, again, here you can see that it's, uh, it's much lower than it has been in previous years, where, you know, it, it's gone up and down between 1.5 and 2.5 and about on average, I'd say. Um, last year we did uh, reach um, an all-time high in uh, percent infection, uh, looking at those positive samples, so it's good to see that it's back down. But, you know, all that inoculum's still out there, and that's the concern, is that all we need is another wet year, and we'll see record high levels again, potentially. Um, Looking at those positives, breaking it up down to the, uh, down to the crop types, um, it's a little bit different here um, because, as you recall, barley, you know, it, it's less likely to have that infection. It's, it's less, uh, less susceptible. But, um, you know, when it is infected, on average, it has been higher than wheat over the past few years, except for last year and this year. Wheat and barley are very similar again. Um, which is good news for barley because it's, it's, you know, it's much lower than we've seen in any other years. 
um, for percent infection. Um, everything else is, you know, not, not too unusual. Durham is, is fairly similar to what it has been in previous years, I'd say. Wheat is lower than, uh, than it has been ever before, though, as well. Um, so now, now I'll get into some uh, maps uh, to break down the um, percent infection or the, the distribution across the province. Um, so this map shows the percent of samples that are testing positive on the plate again, uh, but including all those negative DNA tests. So um, in 2007, it was, and as it, as it goes darker, it increases in percent infection. Um, so in 2007, it was, you know, pretty much just in southern Alberta. We, we had a few samples up in Barhead, but um, for the most part, it was, it was isolated to the south. Um, 2008, we see it in Rocky View, you know, increasing levels in southern Alberta. 2009, uh, we see it in Newell now, a um, little bit lower in some areas. 2010, we see Tabor become, you know, really the, uh, the hot spot in the province. Um, we also see it pop up. It's a little bit hard to see here, but there's Mountain View, Flagstaff, and Acadia there that we're, we're getting uh, some, some positive samples. Uh, 2011 was that year that um, the levels decreased. Um, so it, it was, um, you know, it wasn't as severe as it has been previous years. But 2012 was the year that we really started seeing samples come in from all over the province uh, that were testing positive. Um, so throughout central Alberta, um, there's a few counties that are a little bit higher than others. And now in the south, we're seeing really high levels in Tabor. Um, 2013, we just start to see that increase. Uh, we see it even show up in Mackenzie County, way up north there. Um, that's only a couple samples. We don't test a whole lot of samples from up there, so it's relatively low sample number, keep in mind. Now Tabor we're seeing is pretty much black down there, um, and 40 mile. Um, and we're starting to see some central Alberta counties starting to get a little bit more red. Um, 2014, um, we see it, uh, again, increase. We're starting to see it a lot more along that eastern border now. Uh, 2015, uh, dropped down again, um, but uh, we're, we're still seeing some, some pretty heavy uh, infections down in southern Alberta. 2016, this was last year. This was the worst year yet. Um, and we can really see it uh, fade. You know, the, the highest uh, percent of uh, samples that are testing positive is along that eastern border. And as you move west, it gets much lower. And then this is this year. So, um, you know, it, it's still, like I said, um, low sample number right now. Um, as, as we get more samples in, this, this map will likely change quite a bit. Um, but uh, we are seeing, you know, some counties that are getting getting fair amount of uh, positive samples, even in central Alberta still. Um, if we break it down and include, like, the positive DNA test, so this is the scenario where um, you get that positive DNA but negative plate. So as I said before, you know, this is an indication that it's starting to move into the area. It's been exposed in some way. Um, even back in 2007, um, all the yellow counties are the ones that have those, um, that, that meet that criteria. The red counties here are the ones that have just tested positive on the plate and white is negative. Um, so back in 2007, you can even see that we were getting positives on the DNA in quite a few isolated uh, central Alberta and even up in the Peace. Uh, 2008 here, this was where we see it, you know, positive on the DNA in a lot of those counties where, you know, years later it started showing up uh, positive on the plate. So really it showed that the, that it was there, but um, it, it didn't uh, have that systemic seaborne infection until 2012 or so. Uh, 2009, 2010, things just kind of move around a little bit. 2011, lower levels, and then 2012 here, this was where we start to see it. So yeah, the yellow counties are usually kind of more on the peripheral of the, uh, of the red counties. Um, so it's, it's a good indication that uh, it, it's, it's coming and uh, it's, it will be difficult to keep it out. 2013, 2014, 2015 here, 2016, most, most of the province is red at that point, and 2017. So um, up in the piece, we've had quite a few uh, positives on the DNA, but um, nothing, nothing yet this year that's positive. Um, and uh, e there's still quite a few central Alberta counties that are completely negative right now, but, um, you know, like I said, it's still pretty early on. 
Um, here's the cumulative map to give you an idea um, that most of the province we've had uh, fusarium detected in some way, either DNA, positive on the DNA or positive on the plate. Um, there's just a few counties really, Brazos and an island somehow <laughs> of, of, uh, of uh, fusarium. Um, if we compare our situation with other provinces, though, we're doing quite well, I would say. Um, so we're the, we're the blue line here, and we're pretty much dwarfed by both Saskatchewan and Manitoba. Um, interestingly, we did start out at kind of a similar, you know, level. They were much lower back in 2007 than they are now. Um, but both, both Manitoba and Saskatchewan have, have risen over that time period. Um, Saskatchewan does this interesting thing where year after year it goes up and down, um, and this year it's, it's, it's lower as well. Um, across the prairies, we're getting much lower levels of, uh, of um, infection observed. Um, if, if we look at the per average percent of infection, last year in Manitoba, the average uh, sample was around, uh, I think it's almost up to 18% there, um, infection of Fusarium graminearum. So um, that's, you know, that's almost one in every five seeds that has an infection that's being uh, potentially planted. Um, and, you know, th this year it's around 4%, I think it is there. So it's dropped down quite a bit, which is great news. But um, all that inoculum still out there, potentially in the field, um, in that stubble, and it could, uh, it, could, it could be an issue in the coming years, certainly. Um, and I thought I'd include other Fusarium species as well. It, it doesn't get the same uh, attention as Fusarium graminearum, but it, it can cause the same issue with the seed, which is seedling blights, um, root rots. Um, and this year, you know, like Fusarium graminearum, it is lower than it has been, um, than it was last year at least, and than it, that it has been in, you know, many other years. Um, so, into the part of the presentation where uh, the title uh, comes from, Fetroflying Fungus. So this is a new idea that we're, you know, is very much still in the development stage um, at the lab. Um, and the, the idea is that um, we distribute these uh, spore catchers. Um, they're made by a company called Sporometrics out in Ontario. Um, and they're distributed around the province, and um, they have, um, you can see on the top of that uh, spore catcher, there's a little screw, kind of, um, and you just change them, there's a membrane that's in there, and you can just change it as often as you want, and you just send it into the lab, and then we can do a DNA test. Um, we can test, right now we, we've experimented with Fusarium graminearum and sclerotinia testing. Um, there's a lot of things that we still have to work out. Like I said, it's still very much early in the stages, but I'll share a little bit of the, of the information that we have with you right now. Um, so uh, we had, over uh, 2017, uh, we had sent them out to uh, areas in Bagerville, Viking and Beaver, uh, Beaver Lodge and Lacombe. Um, I'm just going to talk about one of those today, Vagreville, because um, it is kind of interesting information. So this is the chart showing the uh, precipitation um, in Vagreville um, over several months of the summer. Um, and I, I chose precipitation because, um, you know, there are many factors that drive, uh, environmental factors that drive uh, disease, and, um, but uh, precipitation is one of the major ones by far. Um, it is also temperature, but um, it, it would get a little bit more complicated if I included that. <laughs> um, so, um, I, I added on here that this orange line here, this shows um, what we actually tested on, the, um, on, those, on those membranes that were collected from Vagerville. So there's, there's only you know, three sections there. Um, it is broken up. We missed the biggest rainfall event, of course, um, unfortunately, so we didn't get to see how that impacted. Um, to give you an idea of what the data shows, um, it's just relative levels. So the, the lowest um, right along the bottom, that means it was negative. Um, the next highest there, which you can see on the right axis there, is one. Um, th this, is, this is what we determined was less than the limit of detection. So we did see something there, but you know it's not going to be consistently coming up positive. Um, at two there, the next highest level, that was at the limit of detection. So we were confident that was positive. Um, and then at three, that's higher than the limit of detection. We're seeing higher levels. So it's real, it gives you an idea of kind of relative amounts, but um, it's, it's not exact. Um, 
But um, we, we did see this interesting thing where, you know, later in the, in the uh, summer, we were seeing a whole bunch of Fusarium graminearum show up on these disks, um, and we weren't too sure. Um, we did talk to the grower, and apparently he had it located adjacent to a wheat field during these time periods, and then he moved it uh, to a canola field um, later on where we started seeing it pop up. Um, so why was that? Um, it turned out that canola field had wheat on it last year. Um, and we had tested the wheat at the lab, so I looked up the results, and that tested positive on the DNA, but it was negative on the plate. So that's that instance where, um, you know, we're seeing that, um, that, that amount that, if you had just gotten the plate method, we wouldn't know that Fusarium graminearum was there. Clearly it was, because we're seeing a lot of it show up on these spore natives. Um, the wheat seed that was harvested, um, it was from that uh, field uh, from, from the previous year that was planted, um, and it was also the, you know, the, the wheat field that's shown right here as well. Um, and that did come back at 0.5% Fusarium graminearum this year. So that means that, you know, even at this low level that we picked up even less than the limit of detection, um, and I will point out that that is, sim that, that um, the grower uh, told us that that was, uh, during the flowering period was right around that stage. So um, that low level that we were getting there um, was sufficient enough to cause an infection in this field apparently, um, but, there, there's still some information that I kind of want to get that I, that I haven't been able to contact him yet about locations of the field. So I'm interested in knowing how far away was this canola field that had weed on it last year? What other sources of inoculum are nearby for that uh, wheat field this year? Um, I wanted to show you this um, uh, Alberta Fusarium risk map that, uh, you know, was just uh, put out um, over the growing season. And it's this really great tool that allows you to look at um, it looks at the various uh, environmental conditions and it will give you an idea of um, what your fusarium risk is over, over certain periods um, based on location as well. It's really cool, but um, all it looks at is those environmental conditions and that's really important. Um, but if we take it back uh, to the plant disease triangle, um, there's three things that you really need for that plant disease. One is the host, and we know what the host is. It's a cereal, uh, usually. Um, that environmental uh, corner there, um, that's what that map can tell you. Um, we also have the pathogen though, and that's what we're hoping to answer with this, um, with this spore testing um, protocol that we're hoping to develop right now. Um, so it's, it's all about, and the reason that I wanted to talk about this today was because this is the Farming Smarter Conference, and you know, to farm smart, you need to have information, and that's what we try to do at the lab, is to provide you with information so that you can make the best decisions that you can. Um, so it is, you know, still very much in the development pipeline. We just wanted to, you know, put out a few over the last summer just to see if this is a potential that, uh, possibility that we could do. Um, we, we're still looking at the data. We still have to figure out what relevant results are, right? Like, um, what is a high enough inoculum load to actually cause disease in your plants? And maybe that's something that we won't know soon, but um, it's something that, you know, is important to, to answer. Um, and if, if you're interested in this, let the lab know, and, you know, it, it'll, it'll help us to be able to, you know, invest a little bit more in, in developing this, I'm sure. All right, so that, that's my whole presentation. Um, I went a little bit over time here, so we might not have time for questions, but um, you can contact me at, uh, at uh, this contact information on the bottom of the slide here if you have any questions. Do we have time for questions? Well, if there's one quick question. I'll allow one quick question. Maybe there's no such thing as a quick question in the world of Fusarium and uh, 2020 Seed Labs. Now, do you have a booth or are you just going to be wandering? I'm actually going to be heading back to Edmonton right away. Okay. Sorry. All right. So this is your last chance. Now, so it was good news that the levels were way down this year, but that doesn't mean we can stop being vigilant, right? Uh, it's, it's an ongoing battle. It doesn't mean that we're edging ahead or is it, is it a control thing or an environment thing? 
Yeah, like I said um, during the presentation, it's, it's really great that, you know, levels are down, but the, the problem is that, um, you know, the inoculum, um, it doesn't necessarily come from the seed. It comes from the stubble uh, from previous years. So we know in 2016, we were seeing really high levels in the seed. Um, so, it, you know, that means that we could have planted high levels of fusarium this year, which could serve as inoculum for future years. Um, but it, it's, it, it does depend a lot on the environmental conditions um, and a lot of other factors as well. So, um, and you know, once it has moved into the area, you, it, it, it's going to be there. It will move around between hosts, but um, the, the best thing to do is prevent it from moving in an, into an area. And um, the Spornados, you know, gives you an idea of when it's starting to move into that area a little bit earlier, I think. Great, okay, well with that, uh, we wanna say a big thanks to Trevor Blois from 2020 Seed Labs. And again, if you're interested in um, having one of those uh, cool devices on your farm, uh, be sure and uh, contact Trevor or the lab. So thanks, Trevor. <laughs>